Andrea Firth for, for leading this session on finding the right fit. Take it away. Great. Um, well, thank you, Julian. Uh, just put someone else in the room. Uh, so welcome everyone to this Thursday on the Stoop. Uh, like Julian said, and I said before, my name is Andrea Firth, and I'm really pleased to spend this hour with you. Today, we're going to talk about finding the right fit, specifically finding the right fit in literary magazines for your writing. And the fit is important because it's it will greatly increase your chances of publication. Um, so Julian, I appreciate you introducing me uh, so kindly. Um, I, he mentioned I'm an editor at Brevity Blog, and later in the discussion, I'm going to touch on the Brevity Blog as a potential outlet for you and so that you can know more about it. But I'm here today as a writer. You know, I write creative nonfiction. That's my genre, essay, hybrid work. And like you, I work to get my writing published in literary journals. That's my goal. Uh, and then one note today, when I use the terms journals, literary journals, literary magazines, lit mags, outlets, I use those words interchangeably. Um, I've spent a lot of time submitting to lit mags and investigating and evaluating that this somewhat mysterious process. And I found that the mystery to submitting is solvable. I mean, there's a strategy to it and it requires your work and your time. Then there's really no getting around those facts. It takes time, it takes work. However, you can learn to work more efficiently and be more effective at getting published uh, by targeting your, your work to the right journals. Um, so I routinely teach a two hour class on all the aspects of submitting to lit mags from determining if your work is ready through submitting the cover letter, the bio, the contract, and more. Today, you know, we only have this hour and it's a big group, so we're going to focus on this one abs uh, aspect of finding the right fit. Um, I'm going to show some slides. We're going to look at the Chill Subs database and see how we can use that. If you are not familiar with Chill Subs, this is not, uh, you'll see a demonstration of it. The class is not focused on teaching you chill subs, but you'll get enough of a sense of it and you do not need to worry about that. Um, so I have some slides, we're gonna look at chill subs, but then I'm gonna leave plenty of time at the end so that you can ask questions about finding a fit and then, you know, as time permits, any questions you have uh, related to submitting. Um, so let me just get my, um, so I'm not sure that I'll, and Julian will help me out as far as we'll use the chat for questions, but what I'll do throughout the, the presentation is stop and say, hey, does anybody have any questions? Um, because I might not be able to keep up with the chat and then we'll have that time at the end. Um, so any questions so far, like everybody okay with what's happening? Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen and show a couple slides. Okay. So um, one thing about the slides is Julian is, we will be sharing, there's only about 10 or 12 slides, but we'll be sharing the slide set with you after this hour. Um, might take us till tomorrow. There's about 10 or 12 slides, but some of the slides have clickable links. So you're going to end up getting a PDF that'll have the 10 or 12 slides in it. The clickable link, like here's an example on this title slide, my email, my website, if you click on those, it will take you to my email. It will take you to my website. There are other resources related to submitting on other slides. And so you'll have those clickable links and you can click right through. And also you have my email. So if you have questions and follow up, um, I, I feel free to email me. Um, okay, so let's start with a quote from Stephen King. If you don't have the time to read, you don't have the tools to write. So if you take anything away from today, the essential takeaway for a discussion of finding the right fit for your writing in lit mags connects to what Stephen King is, shares here. You have to read. Okay, you need to read the literary journals to understand how they work and what they publish. You need to read journals to know if your work is ready for publication and how to get it there. And you need to read these lit mags to know where to submit to find your fit. You know, it, it, it really comes down to reading. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the share of the slides and I'm gonna take us to chill subs.
Give me one second. Okay, so for some of you are, are probably familiar, some may not be. Chill Subs is a database of literary mag magazines. Um, the Chill Subs organization has over 3,000 magazines profiled in this database. And it's a searchable database. So they give you the tool to apply filters so that you can search this vast database of literary magazines and come down with a list you know, as, as small as five magazines, maybe up to 50, however you decide to structure your search, so you can better target uh, what to read and then what to follow up and submit to. Um, so, so many of you may be familiar. Um, when we go through the process, I just want to do one search and find. It will help you identify things you want to be thinking about for right fit. So let me... Um, Okay, and just let me open up so I can see the group more. Okay, um, everybody can, a thumbs up, Mary Beth, can you see that? Okay, so, and if I'm turning my head, I'm sorry, it's because I'm using a monitor. Um, so you can see here, for four chill subs, you set up an account. It's free to use the database and to search it. So you can see my photo over in the corner here, little Andrea's thumbnail. Um, I have an account. What they have in this database is all of these thumbnails of their 3,000 plus journals where they can include a lot of information about the journal. We're searching just literary magazines. There's other things you can search in their database, but our focus today is lit mags. I'm going to talk a little bit about the filters. So one of the things what I do when I'm, I'm looking to submit, and we're going to assume today that I have a piece that's ready to go, I want to look at, at journals that are open for submission. I'm going to click that right away. And you'll see we went from over 3,000 magazines to uh, just over 1,500. I'm not going to bother today because I want to actually submit something in my theoretical um, example here. I want to see which ones are open. So that's, that's a good filter for you. That's something that helps narrow your search. Um, Journals, some journals charge three to five dollars. Many journals don't charge. For today, I just don't really want to spend the money. I'm trying to watch my budget. So I want to look at the journals that have no fees. Comes down a little bit further as far as the number available. Um, I'm not going to go over, you know, pays. I'm not going to worry about getting paid. Some literary journals do pay, but that's not one of my needs for today. It might be one of yours. Then you go to genres. Chill Subs breaks it down into a lot of genres, you know, broadly generalized fiction down to humor, plays, comic, comics, games. I'm going to pick flash creative nonfiction. Um, you know, I'm actually going to, I think I'm going to create flash fiction, pick flash fiction from what I was seeing. Um, flash fiction means that pieces are a thousand words or less. Um, there are some subgenres within Flash, but for this example, and now we now we're down to five hundred and thirty journals. Um, there's somebody waiting to get in, Julian. Um, you can go further and further specify crime, erotica, fantasy, but since flash fiction is kind of a niche in itself, I think I'm going to just leave it with flash. So we have 530 journals, still a lot of journals to target. I don't think my work is really gonna fit in 530. You can put your specific word count. That's another way to divide things up. I wanted to talk about acceptance rates. So the way acceptance rates work with chill subs is it's based on what writers who are part of the organization and many, many people, I can't remember how many thousands of people are signed up for chill subs now and use the database. Writers will report back their experience with journals. And then chill subs calculates the acceptance rate based on this pool of writers who are submitting and they're t communicating back to chill subs. I got this accepted or declined. So it's not the acceptance rate from the journal but it's an acceptance rate within these, this pool. What I like about acceptance rate is, you know, there's lots of high tier journals out there that are very hard to get into. The Sun, less than 1%, Brevity, 
probably less than 2%. Um, I'm going to set this. I'm going to say, let's go up. I want, you know, I want to change. I, I'm an emerging writer and I, I think I'd like to, I'd like, I want a good quality journal, but I, I, I'd also want, I don't want the bar to be so far over my head. Um, so when I set the acceptance rate at 18%, now we're down to about you know, 49 journals. It really started to, I, I, and again, you can choose these filters, um, but when we are thinking about finding your fit, these are different things that you want to consider. Do I want to go for the highest tier journal? Do I want to go for a place where, you know, as emer an emerging writer or wherever I am in my writing journal uh, journey, I, I can find a fit. Um, response time. Journals can take from one day to six months, and some of them take even longer than six months. Um, we're going to, I, I always recommend, um, that you do simultaneous submissions. I'll talk about that next, but for this, I'm going to put a response time of 30 days. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll give it a month. Um, I'd like to get some feedback. I'd like to know if this piece is working at all. Um, and now we're down to 32 journals. I always, when I'm doing a search, check simultaneous submissions, which means does that journal um, allow that you are submitting to the same piece to other journals at the same time. For me, if a journal says no simultaneous submission, meaning I have to submit to them and then wait till they get back to me, exclusive of all other journals, that journal would really, I'd have to have a really good reason why I would just tie my piece up solely with one journal. Because there's lots of good journals out there for every piece you write. And there's lots of fits. Um, so I always check simultaneous submissions. Um, one other thing I always check that I find is important is has masthead info. So now we're down to 29. What that means is they tell you who publishes it and who the editors are. For me, I need that transparency. That's important to me. I want to know who's behind the journal. I want to be able to see who they are. I want bios or I want a way to look them up because I want to know where my work's being published. I want to get an understanding of what it's about. There can be things that maybe don't align, align with, you know, how I feel about writing, um, how I feel about publishing, and a lack of transparency is one of them. So I always check that. Um, you're founded, I'm not going to put anything in there today, but one thing to consider is a lot of journals launched in the pandemic, like hundreds, and a lot of journals didn't make it through the pandemic, but some did. So you might want to put a minimum year founded to say, you know, I want a journal that's been around for at least five years. I want one that I know it's going to be around. Um, I, I want their archive to be available for a while. I want it, I, I want that to be solid. The flip side of that is I just uh, met an editor at AWP who just who just at the end of January launched a new journal called In Short, and they publish creative nonfiction. Um, she's a professor at, at George Mason, super excited. They're taking call, they're taking submissions right now for their inaugural issue. That could be an opportunity to get in on the ground floor. There, it, it's not, it, it can be a positive, it does, it's not always a negative. Um, we don't have any track rec record, we don't know exactly what In Short's gonna look like. Uh, we don't know if it's going to be around, but um, it still could be, you know, a good way to go. That's something you'll have to think about. Okay. So what happens with chill subs, and again, we're focusing on fit today. Um, for, if you're not familiar with it, on the slide, I had a click, I have a clickable link to chill subs. Click it, go through, play around, get your, you know, get your feet wet with it. This Oh, this search has identified 29 journals that fit the criteria that I picked. And one kind of popped out to me when I did the search earlier. It's called, and we're going to use this one as our um, as our demo. It's called Five on Fit. And I think I've had three or four people in classes or workshops in the last year who have had success with Five on Fit. It's, it's a relatively new journal, I think maybe in the last two, three years. So I thought, well, let's take a look at them. So you can click through. This is still taking you to more information that Chill Subs has about Five on Fifth. 
they publish fic fiction, flash fiction, nonfiction. It kind of confirms all of the filters that you applied. But I want to now with the next step in your journey is you got to go look at the journal. This is the read part. Okay, this is the read part. Um, okay, so I've talked really quickly and I went pretty fast. Any questions? And Julian, any questions in the chat that I need to know about? Okay, I will move on. Um, so here I am at the website for uh, Five on Fifth. Things you wanna look at is how does it look? How does it present? Thinking about it from the standpoint of would I like my work to be on this website? Does the website work or is it glitchy? I mean, these are kind of practical basic things but you really do want to check that out because if you if it, if they only publish online, you want readers to be able to get to your work. So first off, just take a look at what the website looks like and make sure that it works. The next place you're going to go, and I'm only going to go there for a second because it's a dense page, is to their about or submit page where they'll give you lots of information about how to submit. What you wanna focus in on is the mission of the journal. So let, I'm just gonna read the first sentence. Five on the fifth publishes five short pieces online on the fifth of each month. We accept flash fiction, general fiction, nonfiction, horror and science fiction fantasy. The maximum word count for submissions is 5,000. Um, actually, when you go dig deeper in here, for their flash pieces, the word limit is 1,000. So you, here what you learn is they're publishing every month, five pieces a month, 60 chances a year you have for your work to get into five on fifth. That's actually pretty, pretty good. You know, acad journals that are associated with academic institutions often only publish twice a year. And if they only publish three fiction pieces twice a year, that's only six chances. Because it is a little bit of a numbers game. Well, it's more than a little bit. There are a lot of people submitting so the more frequently a journal publishes um, in your genre that fits your piece, the better. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go back to the homepage. There's a lot more information that you can glean from this, but we're really looking at fit. So one of the first things to do is look at the mission. And what they're saying is we're gonna get five really good quality pieces out there every month online. Um, so now let's go look at an issue. Okay, now we're in, you, you really do, to get to know a journal and understand it, you need to read it. Um, um, again, just looking at the aesthetics, nice cover art, clean white background, pretty clear where to go and how to do it. Um, so let's click through. The next thing you look at is the table of contents. So the one thing I don't love about Five on Fifth is the font. I don't think it's a particularly readable font. It looks pretty, not the greatest on the eyes. Okay, my Andrew's little pet peeve aside. Um, here is the table of contents. They tell you about the cover photo because they also um, have a call for uh, art for the covers. There are four pieces. One's general fiction, three flash fiction. And that's what we're looking for today. Andrew has this flash fiction piece. There's an editor's note. And what they explain in the editor's note is, we promise five a month, but this this month we only did four. And the reason we only did four is because we we went for quality over quantity. They give, at least they're being transparent. They did, didn't deliver on their promise, but it explains why there's um, four instead of five. We're gonna look at the flash fiction pieces and look at reading and how you can identify if what they publish aligns with what you do. Um, everybody good for now? Okay, so I'm gonna click through to the first one. Um, Flying North by Jeremy Akel. It's short, so I'm gonna read it aloud. This is less than 150 words. The last time I saw my father, the sandpipers were flying north for the summer. At my feet, miniature crabs hid behind half-eaten groundfish, the discards of shrimp boats trawling just offshore. The sandpipers, fat from winter feeding, ignored them. It was late March, and above me waves of shorebirds had begun to return to the Arctic. 
Summers, summers are difficult for migratory birds. There is an abundance in warmer weather with mayflies and crickets, and on occasion, a tart berry, but also competition, and sandpipers are by nature solitary. Um, okay, so far, it's a scene-based piece. Um, it's uh, about a sense of place. You know, here we are, um, offshore, there are birds, two characters, an I narrator and my father. And some tension has been established um, the last time I saw my father. It's subtle though. Um, and then this is a difficult time for migratory bir birds. So they're setting some tension, um, but let me go further. I'm gonna sell a truckload this year, I know it. My dad and I walked along the shoreline, the salt water foaming and bubbling between our toes. Trust me, when I come home, things are gonna change, I swear. When he said this, a sandpiper hopped once, then twice, and then, yielding to some primeval instinct, took wing and flew away. Okay, so there was scene setting in the beginning. We get a sense of place, a little bit of tension. Then we get just two lines of dialogue. And from that, we get more tension and we get the plot. It's spare. It's really spare. It's not, you know, the piece is only 150 words. Um, we get a strong verb, I swear, which really pr provides characterization of the father and what's going on here. These, they, they're having a rough time. Um, and then it returns to the sandpiper and the metaphor that's been working along the way. So what do you learn about this piece? And I know I'm going through it pretty quickly. It's spare writing, it's lyrical, um, metaphor at work. There's nature, a sense of place, a feeling of nostalgia. It still reads as a narrative though. It still reads as a story. The last time I saw my father, Sandpiper's running around. He tells me he's gonna work it out. Things are gonna change. And then the bird flies away. It's a story with a beginning, middle and an end. And it reads in chronological order, but it's very lyrical. So what that tells you is you think about if you have your flash fiction piece, how does your piece align with this? Journals are gonna publish a range of styles, et cetera. But as you read them, you want to, you can start to take away what these editors are looking for, what this journal publishes. Any questions on that? Does is that start resonate? We're going to go through the other two a little. Um, okay. Let me just watch my time. Okay. So this is called free fall. I'm not going to read the whole thing. This is 373 words. So long, you know, twice as long, more than twice as long as the previous one, but not even close to a thousand words. So they've said their word limit is a thousand. This also has a first person narrator. I'm just gonna read the first line of the first four paragraphs. I sit on the edge of the world watching the sunset over the far rim of the Grand Canyon. I sit on the edge of an edge, a small jut in the rock below, the rim just far enough down to be jumpable for 45 year old knees. I've, I've yearned for this view for 40 years, ever since I heard the camp leader talk about it back in Cub Scouts. Jenny calls me again. Okay, so I know we didn't read the whole thing, but again, sense of place, Grand Canyon, 40 years to get here. You know, a lot of nice language, descriptive, um, having the narrator set the scene where he or she is, and then Jenny calls again. Still, it's moving chronologically as a story. It's narrative. So and when I put it, it's not particularly experimental at this point. It's not going out of order. Then we're going to skip down a couple paragraphs. The Grand Canyon has this geological mystery called the Great Unconformity. There's a gap in the rock layers. One layer from 250 million years ago lies right on top of a rock that is 1.2 billion years old. No one knows why or what happened to the hundreds of millions of years missing time. Okay, so here we have factual information. It, it connects because we're at the Grand Canyon and it's about the Grand Canyon, but it falls outside of this story where Jenny's calling and this, uh, this man's sitting, taking in this great view. So there is a little bit, this is, you know, 
a little bit of an experimental structure. It's incorporating research and factual information. It's pushing this metaphor again. Like the Grand, clearly the Grand Canyon is is has is a big thread to this piece. Um, so it moves on and it goes back. Oh, and I wanted to, after that the next line: Jenny is pregnant again. So the story of the narrator and Jenny is being braided around his visit to the Grand Canyon. Um, nice structure. Again, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call it lyrical, um, but using some interesting, strong craft. Um, so again, similar to the last piece, strong metaphor at work, reads like it, but it still reads like a story with a beginning, middle, and end. All right, and then I'll go to the next one. Um, so this one, I'm not gonna read it except for uh, the first and last lines. It's called Dreamscape. This one's uh, 960 words. So almost a thousand. So what that tells you is, because sometimes you'll go to journals and they'll have a word count, like we, we publish up to 2,500 words, 3,000 words. But then when you read the journal, most of the pieces are 1,000 or 1,200 or 1,500 words. What you've learned here from reading one issue is they're publishing flash fiction anywhere from very short, short, to almost the word count limit. So your piece can probably fit, as far as word count, it can fit in here. Um, I would recommend you probably best to read three issues, not just one. But in, in three issues, maybe up to five, in three issues, journals don't change up their um, table of contents that much. Uh, so I think you can get a good sense of how many flash pieces they publish and the range of the word count. And stylistically, some of the things here we're seeing repeat. Um, this starts out in my dream. Uh, you were jubilant, vibrating like a plucked string of a guitar. You said you had enough of the race and were walking away to, to go to film school. Maybe at NYU, maybe at SoCal, you weren't sure, but that part you assured me didn't matter. Um, so again, nice language, two characters. These shorter pieces, you can't have that many characters. A narrator and then you, her partner. Um, this is a segmented piece. You see these asterisks? So this, it's a more complex piece because they, the writer has more space. It's a scene um, and then, then the couple moves on to someplace, onto a bar and then they move on to someplace else. It's segmented more it's happening. There's a fair amount of dialogue. It's moving in chronological order and they're having an interaction. It's about their relationship. Um, keeps moving on. Each segment's kind of structured about uh, similarly with a fair amount of um, dialogue and exposition. And then, um, let me make sure I covered everything. And this is a little bit of a spoiler alert, but um, I'm gonna read the last line or last couple lines. Floating miles above me, I saw your face. You bent down, pulled me close, then whispered, it was only a dream. So piece opened with, in my dream, and then it closes with, it was only a dream. There's a twist. So a twist is very classic structure for um, flash fiction and flash creative nonfiction. It's often what you'll see. So that also tells you something about the kind of flash fiction that they publish. I wouldn't describe it as super experiment experimental. It's the kind of structure that you'd see in a smoke long quarter, quarterly, which is a well, very well-known journal for uh, flash fiction and nonfiction. Um, so you learn something about the pieces. And I think the biggest thing to do is now that you've, and you would have the time to read these pieces start to finish, is when you read three pieces, you think about your own piece and how does your piece align or not align? It doesn't have to be identical, but does it fall on, could you see it being put in this mix. And if you read two more issues and you, so now you've got nine or 10 pieces that you've read, could you see your piece being a part of it? This is what I mean by finding the right fit through reading. Um, okay, let me stop that share. Um, I'm gonna check. 
Um, is Julian, do, are there any questions in the chat that I need to? There is a question about submittable. Um, I don't know if you want to address that right now, but it was about their vibe filter. And then I just got another question after that. Okay, so it was Chill Subs has a vibe filter. And even if they said submittable, I think they meant Chill Subs. Did so I, did, um, I didn't show it um, on the filters. They have the vibe of the journal. That is something that um, it, it can happen two ways. The journal editor can choose the vibe or Chill Subs. Of those 3,090 journals, they've actually uploaded a lot of it. They go to the websites for the journal and they answer all the questions to kind of distill. You know, you go into journals, you're looking all over the place. They've really formatted and pulled the information out to make it neat and tidy and easily accessible for you. So they will put a vibe as well. Um, so I wouldn't consider that it's not um, a statistic, it's subjective. Um, but I think that they pretty much get it on the mark. Like one of the vibes is identifies that, that this is a high tier, really hard, difficult journal to get in. Um, I think the one in the middle is uh, something like challenging, but less intimidating. Uh, so I think it's just another another factor, another thing you can consider. Um, so Chris B, do you wanna say your question? I'm wondering about your insights into um, journals that are associated with a university or college where the initial readership is maybe changing over every semester because it's students who are doing the reading. Do you find that the aesthetic of the journal reflects those changes or do you find that those early readers are maybe being trained to stay on brand, so to speak, and that the aesthetic is pretty solid or pretty stable and unchanging? Um, so it's a really good question. And um, my answer is going to be, it depends. I think when you have like um, the Missouri Review, it, it's well-established, long you know, decades around, they have a very clear established um, aesthetic, what you're going to find in there. Um, other journals that are, haven't been around as often um, might not have that. And or it, I do think it's, de it's determined by how how actively invested the faculty are in the journal or if it's a consistent editor-in-chief who is recruiting these readers. Um, I know it, where I went at St. Mary's that they've had a lot of turnover. So I think the journal doesn't have as much consistency. Um, so I'm sorry, I think it, 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 it depends. And again, that kind of come down, comes down to reading. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think it's it's helpful to think about looking at if we're going back three or four issues, is it the same editor in chief? And what is that person's role yeah. at the university would be helpful. Thank you. That's really helpful. Sure. Um, okay. I'm going to share my screen and I just go through a few more slides. I probably won't go through all of them because I want to leave time for questions. Um, oh, and Julian, was there one more question? There were two more questions now. I don't know if you want to answer them both, but I'll just tell you what they are. Um, okay. The first one from Mary Beth, and it says, um, Andrea, it sounds like you write the piece, then research to find a place for it. Do you recommend that over sorting through themed calls or finding a journal that you like and then creating a piece that fits the journal? So that was the first one. Okay, so I, no, I'll go ahead and answer that. So if I'm working on an essay and I've had the idea and it's, I just work on the essay and I find the journal, the outlet later. There were two things in there. I don't tend to there's some journals that I really love. Like I mentioned the Missouri Review. I'd love to get into the Missouri Review. I haven't, I've submitted, <laughs> I get some nice feedback, but I haven't, I, you know, gotten that prize yet. But I don't sit down and write to the Missouri Review. I think I've just come to understand that it tends to be what I write. I do kind of write under their aesthetic umbrella. Um, but you mentioned theme calls. I do respond to those. So journals will have uh, not all, some, they have it, some have it every issue, some have it occasionally where they say, I'm going to dedicate this issue to this theme. Um, I've mentioned Dorothy Parker's Ashes a lot because it's a journal I really like. Um, unfortunately, for uh, it, it's only for women and women identi who uh, identify that way. Um, they're, they are a theme called every issue. So I look, I watch their themes and if one of them resonates, then I will write to that theme. Or I look for journals um, 
I have pieces and I look in, you can get this in newsletters, which is a topic. Uh, I can talk more about newsletters at the end if we have time. You can get a list from Duotrope and from Chill, Chill Subs. You can get a list from Chill Subs of themed calls and I'll go through that list. And if I find a, a, a theme, a journal has a theme for, um, I think uh, Dorothy P Parker just did Panic. And if I happen to have a piece on Panic that's already in the hopper, then I can submit. So I'll respond to theme calls. I don't tend to write just to a journal, um, but I think you will find that the journals that you like to read or the ones that you start to explore and you read and you, you're interested in them and, and they seem to, you like them, you like them because you like the writing. And if that writing aligns with your writing, then that probably can become a journal that you could go back to. I resubmit to journals quite often. I have, now I'm kind of have my stable of uh, journals that I often submit to, and but I'm always trying to add it add to it. And the other question? Well, we're, we have three or four at this point. Um, uh, but the the first one was if from Adenike. If I posted a nonfiction piece on my own personal blog, can I submit it to lit mags and journals after editing it and changing it? Uh, so most journals won't accept previously published work and publishing on a blog is considered previously published. That said, there are some journals like the poetry journal Rattle. They don't consider publishing on your blog blog um, or anywhere on social media previously published, but they are unique. Most journals, even publishing it on Instagram uh, or elsewhere is considered pre previously published. If you change it, usually the rule, the guideline is that you've changed it up to at least 50%. Even that's kind of subjective, but if you've doubled the length, um, you know, change the the beginning and the ending um you know say what you had put up before was really just the nugget of the idea um i think that's probably fine and i would take the blog post down um I, you know i'll go ahead and answer questions because i think um well, you know what, let me go over I'll, I'll, i'm going to show the the slides one more time um and then but i we're going to move through them okay um, so I just wanted to I, use the sun as an example. It's just going to reiterate what we what I showed you with um, five on fifth. When you look at the sun, very high tier journal, and you can see this just from online, the cover, which they have a thumbnail of the dog's face, the sun is published on really high quality, thick, glossy um, paper. It's expensive. It's quality, you know, they can do that because they have a very large subscription base, but that tells you something about the journal. The, the cover art is always black and white, always a high quality, interesting, provocative photo. Um, when you look at the, then I said, then you go look at the table of contents. What you learn from the sun, July, 2021, it's published monthly. The categories, they always have an interview. Then the creative nonfiction category, essays, memoir, et cetera. They have three pieces, fiction they have one, one short story, and poetry here they have four. The Sun is more heavily weighted to poetry and creative nonfiction. They run four to five poems, three to four essays. They only ever have one short story. So for the fiction writer out there, you have 12 chances in a year to get into the Sun um, versus the essayist has more. So just the table of contents can tell you um, and then again, looking at the website, the sun's got a very sleek, good looking website, very functional, you know, black and white with splashes of color. So again, you wanna check the quality of the journal's website, check the masthead, who, who's involved in this journal? Um, read the journal's description and mission statement. And we're gonna look at that a little bit. Um, check how long it's been around. Next, you go to the guidelines and then you can learn more. So I'm, I'll give us the sun example, and uh, then we can go back to some questions. So when you go to the submission guidelines, along with all of the basic details that you need to, um, as far as how to submit, um, et cetera, your editors will also give you the mission and more information about what they're looking for. And the sun's a great example. So for essays, the sun says, 
Send us the one where you're so unguarded you need editors you can trust and compassionate readers who will honor your vulnerability. They're looking for pieces where you're really opening up. You're ripping, ripping the Band-Aid off. Essays that seek to understand the world from a fresh perspective and that wrestle with the questions that resist easy answers. You know, fresh perspective, asking and answering things that aren't easy. This isn't a light piece. This is a piece, the anecdote that's tied to the essay can be light, but the writer needs to dig in. That's what these editors are looking for. Uh, for fiction, send us your emotionally honest story. It's fiction, but they're still looking emotionally honest. The one that helps us learn what it feels like to be someone else. Share satire that hits close to home, tragedy that's cathartic without being manipulative, or a parable that lingers long after we finish reading. Um, so the kind of fiction, they give you a range of examples. You can do it in, in different ways, but they still want um, something that helps us learn. We're looking for stories in any genre, any genre of fiction that take risks to tell us something true about ourselves. So you can you can submit fantasy um, to the sun, but it still needs to teach us something about, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be human nature, but something that we can bring back to learn about ourselves. And then poetry, send us your poem that basks in the mysteries of the universe, the one where the smallest details tell us about our place in the world. Share reflections on your relationships, questions for God, or an elegy for something you've lost. So three different, you know, wide ranging examples of the type of poems, but here you get, I think, I think they give you a very strong clue and you would get this from reading it as well. We're looking for poems, usually a narrative, but always accessible that invite us into your confidence and lead us to revelation. They don't, they're looking for narrative, always accessible. This isn't a place for experimental poetry. Um, so even without reading the sun in the guidelines, the editors have really given you a good sense of what they publish. And a lot of journals do that. Um, the sun also says like many jour journals, we're particularly interested in submissions from marginalized voices. So I did wanna point out one resource, it's called Galleyway. And they champion diverse voices um, in literature it's a volunteer organization. Their monthly newsletter has calls for submissions specifically for BIPOC writers. Um, so if this is a category, if you fit this category, this is a resource for you. Um, okay, and so I have a few other examples, but of different journals, but I think through Five on Fifth and through The Sun, we've gotten an idea of how to read for fit, both just in the journals, uh, what they give you on the website, and then digging in and reading. Um, why don't we, give me one second. Um, why don't we take some questions and then I'll, I'll go back to this. Would that be okay, Julian? Oh yeah, we've got a few of the chat. Um, I don't know if you want to start with the hand raised or with the chat. Um, how, how about a hand raised? Um, and I hopefully, uh, if I pronounce this correctly, Andalyn? Yeah, you got it right. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about um, the timeline of submissions. I submitted a piece to a big magazine in September, and they got back to me four months later, this January. And they said that the piece had been passed from the reading team onto the editors for a final decision, and that I'd hear soon. But it's now been a, another month, and I haven't heard anything. So I'm wondering like, about the etiquette of following up with them, or if I should just keep waiting. Um, yes, yeah, super good question. And, and well, one, congratulations. That's great. Your piece has really moved um, through Thank their you. system. Um, I think it's unfortunate that they didn't share with you what that time frame was going to be. Do you know when uh, the next issue is coming out and what issue this might be targeted for? Um, I don't, they base their theme on the pieces that they select. So I don't know. Um, and okay. yeah, they just said the word soon. <laughs> I th I think a month is um, an appropriate time to have waited and you can follow up. 
Okay. Do you have any? I, I, would, I would probably have waited a minimum of two weeks, but definitely with a month. I think it just a brief uh, email back, just, you know, checking in. Mm -hmm. It's a very big magazine, though. Do you think it that's okay still? I don't do think you... a month is, no, it's not going to work against you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Um, Julian? Yeah. So let's see. We talked about that one. Uh, sorry, just scrolling. Um, someone wanted more information about all the newsletters one can subscribe to. Um, and then uh, maybe a more kind of interactive question. Um, what are best practices for author interviews that you want to pitch to a literary magazine? Should you get a yes from the magazine first or the author, even if you don't have a yes from the magazine yet, et cetera? And when contacting the author, is any point of contact okay, whether a publicist or agent, book publisher, or directly to the author? Great, great questions about interviews. And just for everyone out there, uh, in addition to you know fiction, nonfiction, and poetry, journals publish book reviews, they publish interviews with authors, and th those can be other ways of getting uh, one, maybe that's what you'd like to do and that's what you write, but it's another entree into a journal to get a piece published and to get to know the journal editors. And if you're just trying to establish yourself as a writer to get some clips. Uh, so first thing about one, whoever you wanna interview, you should be in contact with them first to know that you can get the interview. Um, you definitely, and you don't have to know exactly where you're going to, um, where it's going to be published because you're going to have to pitch it. And the person being interviewed should understand that, but you can also put that in your, uh, email to them. The best way to contact them is when you start at their website and see how they accept contacts. Some writers, whoever you're interviewing actually say these kind of requests go through their, you know, PR firm or their agent. Or sometimes you can go, ideally you email them directly and you just outline, I'm interested in you for X, Y, for X, and I would like to do an interview looking at Y and potential outlets that I was thinking to pitch it to are A, B, and C. Um, as far as where you get it in, again, now you go to the guidelines for the journal. So you want to make sure you're targeting this interview to a place that's appropriate, that's a fit. And then you go to their guidelines to see what they require. Most, well, I shouldn't say most, um, usually it always requires a pitch, meaning that you send an email to the editor outlining what interview you want to do with who, what's it about, um, what the angle is, and why it's a fit for that magazine. Uh, so like for Brevity Blog, we accept interviews, but they start with a pitch, whereas everything else we accept comes in completely written already. Um, did that answer the individual's questions? Hopefully. Okay. This um, one was, um, I think it's become, I noticed that it's become standard to thank editors on social media for publishing an essay. I have a piece coming out in April and I want to do the right thing. That's from Angelique. Oh, yeah. So, well, there's two things going on there is that you have a piece coming out you want to share it with the world, one for yourself so that other people can see your writing, and two for the journal. The journal really appreciates that. Appreciates that. For Brevity Blog, I'm, and I just I give that as an example because I edit there, We every piece that we publish, and we publish an essay every day, gets a post in two different, in multiple places on social media, and we do that. But we also much appreciate and kind of expect the writers to promote it through their channels too. So whatever your channel is, um, you could, maybe you're sending an email to your, your writing group and say, you know, I, I really appreciated working with the editors at X magazine and here's my piece. And you can copy that editor, social media, same kind of post and then tag them. Um, great idea to do. Um, I only, my only social media that I use is Instagram. Uh, so I usually put, the cover or the art that's with the piece. And then in my, in the post, I, you know, say, you know, a shout out to Bex at Dorothy Parker's Ashes. Um, great to work with on my piece, that sort of thing. Yeah, congratulations, Angelique. Yeah, good luck. Yeah, tag me too, so I can read it. Um, any more, Julian? Uh, no more in the chat. Okay, and I don't, there's no more hands, right? Okay, so uh, just quickly, I'm going to go back to the slide set. Um, 
Okay. So when you get the slide set, there will be a couple of other journals that I didn't have time to go over, but these are ones that you can take a look at. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, I might, uh, I, I'll send a brief, I'll send the, along with the um, slide set, I'll just spend, send a, a brief sheet that kind of talks about each of those journals so you can learn what I was hoping to have time to share. Um, big takeaway is you're looking for the right fit. And I'm not the only person that says this. Journal editors say it all the time. And I'll just read one of these. Like most literary magazines, we ask that anyone submitting work be familiar with our publication. Somehow, please read what we publish and see if your work fits our vision before you submit your work. And even if a journal, some journals have subscriptions, even if they have a subscription, you usually don't have to pay. They usually have at least some of their content available online for free. Um, you, you really can access it. And um, yeah, I'm gonna skip ahead a little. Um, another thing that I wanna leave you with is kind of is a reframe is that success happens when you submit. Um, it, it's, it, it's success happens when you get a piece accepted for sure. But really when you're going through the process, I like to look at it like when I've gotten to the point where I've done the work, the piece is done, it's polished, it's, it shines, it's ready to go. And now I found one, two, five, ten journals where I think it's a good fit and I do the work and I submit it, that's when I've been successful. Um, and then if I get a couple declines, you know, I have other journals that I backfill with. So if you can really look at it is you are being successful as a writer submitting when you hit submit. Um, I also wanted to share with you on the fourth Thursday of every month, I run a free session on Zoom. It's called Submit It Now. And it's kind of like, a, it's like a co-writing session. Really what we spend the most, we spend an hour just working on submitting, reading journals, um, doing the physical work of submitting. The group comes together. It's kind of like, a, it's accountability. We come together to do that. I start the session, say the first 10 to 15 minutes, going over some question relating to submitting or some resource. Uh, so we start that way. We do some intros, we all get to work, and then we check back in at the end. Um, and I welcome you to come. The next time I'm offering it is February 22nd. It's uh, It starts at 6 p.m. Eastern time, 3 p.m. Um, Pacific. And when you get the slides, you'll have the link so you can find it. Um, and oh, I know we've got to wrap up. But I did want to tell you about Brevity Blog because now that we've been in this room together, I consider us writing friends, and I would love to read your work. So Brevity Blog, just a little distinction, it's not actually a journal. Uh, we publish high quality essays, one every day of the week. They're related to the writing of creative nonfiction and the writing life. So they have to be, that's the focus of the Brevity Blog. Um, where, we're fun, where we're different is that we move so quickly and we publish so month, so much, like one every day. Um, and also when you submit to the blog, it doesn't happen every time, but to the extent that we can, as far as editors have time, if your essay is declined, um, you often get some feedback from us. You know, it's not pages, but a, you know, a sentence, a few sentences, a paragraph, a paragraph or two that we're hoping that could help you in the revision process. Um, so that's another way that we're a little different from a journal. Um, so there's the link. It's free and we accept submissions year round. And again, I would love to read your work. Okay. Um, I think we're coming on to the top of the hour, but any more questions, um, Julian? There was one in the chat. Let's see. Um, Thank you for your help on this, by the way. Uh, Joanne says, I don't have enough experience to know for sure, but do you think there are trends that you will, I think there might be a word missing, um, amongst many journals such as sparse or brevity. I'm not sure. Oh, are there rules for submitting? Nope, sorry, unrelated. Um, Joanne, are you there? Maybe you can help me. 
I was typing too fast. <laughs> so, um, so it's, I'm just saying, trying to say, based on my limited experience, I've, I've been reading The Sun for years, absolutely love it. But even with them, I feel like there's shifts that happen around, you know, the kinds of things they seem to uh, want to publish or publish. And um, part of my challenge with that is I, the piece that I really very much want to get published somewhere, somehow, someday, I don't think fits that. In fact, I, I did submit to them a long time ago, not realizing how competitive it was. So, um, but I've submitted to one other journal and um, yeah, so I think, I don't know, I'm just trying to decide in my head, is it really not even worth the effort because they're not, um, you know, it's just not the type of thing they think the general public, you know, would, I don't know. So I didn't know, I, I just felt like there's kind of trends sometimes that. I think, you know, so I, um, you raise a, a number of uh, good issues. Um, one with things like the sun, that's what's great about chill subs and having 3000 journals The you know, the sun's out of reach for probably all of us in this room. Um, although they publish emerging writers. So I think there are a lot of other journals out there that you can consider. Um, and But it does take the time, do some searches, um, use that acceptance rate. That acceptance, you know, you go to what, find one that accepts 50%. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that they're, if, if you go and read the journal, it, as long as it's, you like the writing and it's it's good writing, it's a good place for you to be because then you get that link and then you you can share it and it do, and it does depend on your goals. Um, I think journals, you know, they do have different kind of work that they like, and I do hear from people like you know I kind of write more nostalgic pieces and I can't seem to find a home. I think those homes are still out there for those pieces. Um, it just might take you some time. Um, hopefully that answered. Um, I oh, the other thing is, you know what? You need to be submitting it to, to 10 at a time. I always submit to a minimum of five and I have five more um, on the back burner to backfill. Um, it, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate I have had things published, but I can tell you, I've, I've submitted some pieces 15, 20 times. So, uh, there's a lot of us out there submitting. Um, Anne Ellen Dichter. Sorry, can you just put your contact information again in the chat? It was just a little because I was writing, you know, for this this group you mentioned. Thank you. Oh, so my personal contact information? Well, whatever the the contact is for the 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 group that you just mentioned, you showed us the slide a couple of minutes ago. This critique, this writing group, uh, that was open on Zoom. Oh, okay. That'll be so. When you get the slides, there's two clickable links there. One is goes directly to the Zoom. Oh, we will be get. Oh, we'll be getting them. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you so much. You, okay. You'll get the slides and you'll get the clickable links. Great. Um, Thank I, you. I'm not coordinated enough to put stuff in the chat. Okay. <laughs> um, Thanks. And if for folks, I know it is um, just it's a uh, two minutes after the hour, but we have a couple more questions, and I'm happy to stay if it's okay with Julian. Um, I just want to let if you do need to go, I really appreciate you coming. Um, and then Julian's going to post the video. Uh, Claire Shields. Oh, hi. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, great. I'm very grateful for this. I'm a newcomer to your group, um, but I've been aware of them. And I did put a question in the chat, and it was about poetry. That is what I do. I write poetry for many years. I've got a huge, whatever you want to call it, portfolio or something. I've never been um, published. I I really appreciate, you know, your invitation to people for the fourth Thursday thing. But that's what I'm interested in principally, you know, and I saw that the sun that sounds pretty prestigious and a good journal does take poetry. Um, so I would again, I, I, go ahead. I, I use the sun because um, it is the gold standard and I like right. that and their submission guidelines, how they really, the editors really tell you what they're looking for. So that's why I use them. I don't think it's a good um, example for me to use for an emerging writer who's trying to get published for the first time. No, um, I agree. I don't want to start there, but I'm just, my question was just myself leaning into being published is a big deal. And I have not done that yet. And I didn't want to start there, but where to start, how to start. 
I think where to start is where I started is the first thing to do is to start to read some literary journals and understand what that land, what, what they do, what they look like, what they publish. Um, okay. if you don't read it. If you've never read a literary journal or hardly ever, that's the first thing. And it, it's, I kind of find it amazing that a lot of times people have never opened a literary journal, but they're, they're getting ready to submit. Okay. Yeah. Um, so first thing would be to read some, and then the, I'm going to give you one little hint um, for the poets out there. Open Door, the journal Open Door publishes lots of poetry. They pub they they might be bi monthly now. A friend of mine is one of the editors. Um, they publish like 40 or 50 poets every issue, so they're publishing a lot of poetry. It's good quality. She's a great editor, um, but their their goal is to publish emerging writers. Um, so for the poets out there, that I think that's a good place to start reading and take a look at. Um, I know a number of poets that have gotten published in there. That is great. So when you're looking at journals, I know this is going to sound really naive, but you're talking about hard copy, me going to buy it, something I hold in my hand, not online. No, I'm talking almost 99% online. Oh, OK. So Open Door is online. Yeah. A lot of journals today are only online. It's the oh. higher end ones that, that have subscriptions like the Sun that publish in print as well. But many, many journals are only online and almost every journal is print. If they do have a print version, they have an online version. Sometimes their online version differs, it's different content. Um, but okay. no, you, you just spend some time online. Great, yeah, the open door sounds like a great place for me to start, thank you. Um, We've got maybe three more questions in the chat. Do you want to take them? Um, I'll take them, Julian, but it's I, I defer to you because it, it's your Thursday as well. Well, maybe I'll just say this. I'm going to paste some links in the chat, um, Blue Stoop related things. So check those out. It's like a survey about how everything went today, how, how Thursdays on the Stoop are in general, uh, classes with financial aid opportunities, things like that. Um, and then I will uh, take it back to you, Andrea. Okay, you know what, how about this, Julian? We'll take these three questions. And then if there are any other questions, if you can save the chat, I'm gonna put a document with the slides. I'll answer the questions in that, if anyone's, any questions I don't get to. Okay, first one is, um, do you have a spreadsheet for the work that you submit? How do you organize your submissions from Regina? Uh, so I do keep a spreadsheet for the work that I submit where I put the title of the piece where I've submitted it, when, when I hear back, um, and then any notes, because sometimes if you get a personalized decline, and I say decline, not rejection, because I think it's, uh, journals turn you down for all sorts of reasons, and I don't think they're necessarily rejecting you. So sometimes if they write, hey, this, this didn't quite fit, but, you know, we thought it was working well, and we'd like to see more, more work from you, I'll put that in the notes. Um, so I do keep a spreadsheet. Most Many, I would say the majority of journals work via submittable. That's what, and for the folks that aren't familiar with it, that's another class, but it's, that's the submission manager you use to submit. Submittable also tracks um, what you've submitted. And you, if you, uh, so you can use that. I like my own spreadsheet because I group uh, pieces together and I have more flexibility and I can sort it. Um, so yes. Okay, Julian. Um, from Joyce, are there rules for submitting book reviews? It's similar to a previous question, but maybe slightly different. Um, there, if a journal publishes book reviews, they'll have guidelines for, you know, length, what kinds of books they're looking for. But if you are not, um, and you also want to look at other book reviews that they've published, because, you know, it's a real book review, like a New York Times book review, that's a real skill in art and books don't always get a positive review. What you may, what you'll find in some journals is they'll do a book review, but it's a softer book review. There, it's it's a summary, it's some, it's some anal analysis of the craft, but it's not really aimed to, you know, say yes or no, like this was well done or not well done. Um, so you, I think, again, it comes down to reading the guidelines and reading the book reviews. And then if you've never done a book review, there's lots, I take a webinar, I, I do, I get some training. And then one yes. more. Yeah, one more. 
um, from Fran. Um, what about when there's a shakeup at the journal, like the longtime editor of The Sun retiring? Uh, well, so with The Sun, um, well, he, th the editor retired, uh, who had been around for 50 years. They're, they've been announcing that, um, like over the course of a year or two, uh, who the new editor was going to be. There was actually, I thought that transition was really quite well documented. And I think he's still around in an, an emeritus kind of way. Um, so I don't really think of that as a shakeup. And the new editor has actually kind of talked about how he's moving forward and he, he's not announcing any big changes. So I think you need to pay attention to, to what they say and when they do it and how they do it. Um, there have been other more dramatic shakeups when, you know, entire editorial teams have left. And then I think then you have to kind of read the journal for a while and wait and see. Hopefully that helps. Okay. Um, all right. So we'll, I, it's 10 minutes after. And so I want to respect everyone's time. Um, I thank everyone for coming very much. Uh, slides and um, like a little follow-up sheet will follow. Um, I'm going to say uh, by Monday to give both J Julian and I some time to pull it together. And um, yeah, I, I, I wish you all the best I, with your writing and your submitting. Thank you. Thank you. This was this was wonderful, really. Thank you. You packed Thank you so both. much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bye. Thanks, Julian. Bye, everyone.